The fourth theme that chapter one is divided into uh, is a theme of interactions. Now this theme can apply to biology at a lot of different levels. You know, anytime you take smaller parts and put them together to build a larger system, you're relying on the fact that those smaller parts are going to interact with each other to help those system properties emerge. Um, and so this is, again, very true for living organisms. When you take cells um, and they're built out of organelles, you expect that each organelle will be able to do its job and interact with other organelles to help keep that cell alive. Or if you think about um, you as an organism, you have different organ systems. It's great that your heart pumps blood, but if your heart isn't linked to blood vessels, that blood is just going to spurt out everywhere, right? You want that blood delivered to specific locations within your body, and the blood vessels help to do that. So you need those interactions between smaller parts to keep a system running smoothly. And so what we're going to do over the next few slides is take a look at interactions both um, on the large scale, let's say within an ecosystem, and then also on the small scale looking at interactions of maybe even molecules within the cell. So let's take a look at ecosystems first. Interactions within ecosystems are pretty easy, I think, to identify. And these interactions can be beneficial or they can be harmful to one or both of the organisms involved. Um, so something that would be beneficial to both uh, organisms involved in the interaction, um, think of Shark Week. Right? You watch Shark Week on television, you've probably seen sharks swimming with those little sucker fish. They're called remora attached to the outside of the shark. And this is an interaction that's beneficial to both organisms. So the remora, of course, get protection from the big bad shark. Nobody's going to want to mess with you if you're hanging out on the back of a shark. Um, they also get food, food in the form of maybe bits and pieces that go floating by because the shark's not a very neat eater, uh, but also primarily uh, the remora spend a lot of time eating parasites off the surface of the shark, so they get nutrients that way as well. Now, how is this beneficial to the shark? It might seem that like it could be a little annoying having these fish, uh, you know, hanging out with you all the time, but because they eat the parasites off of the shark, it keeps the shark actually much healthier. So again, this is a beneficial um, relationship for both uh, organisms involved. An example of uh, an interaction being beneficial to one organism and uh, harmful to the other, I think that's pretty simple, lion and zebra, right? One's going to have a great meal and one's going to be a great meal. Um, and then lastly, maybe harmful to both organisms involved. Think of um, two plants, maybe seedlings, that are vying for the same nu nutrient-depleted soil. Neither one is going to win, right? They're both only going to get part of the nutrients they need, they'll both have stunted growth, um, so that competition will be harmful to both. Now, interactions don't just have to be between living organisms. You can also have living organisms uh, interacting with their uh, abiotic or non-living environment, soil, water, air, and the like, right? So organisms also have to interact with those physical uh, factors in their environment. And by living there, they can definitely affect the environment by living there. Um, so think about humans, right? We interact with many organisms as we go through our day. Uh, we also interact with the environment that we live in. And if you think about it, let me ask you a question. Do you think that humans have at all affected the environment that we live in? And I hope that the answer is a resounding yes. Maybe in some cases for the better, but probably in most cases for the worse. Now we're having to you know, sort of play catch up and see how we can fix the things that we've broken on our planet. All right, let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum and talk about interactions um, on the small scale that happen within organisms. So you're going to have, again, interactions between various components of a system. So organs have to interact with each other. Tissues within an organ have to interact with each other. Cells within tissues, they have to talk to each other. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to per perform their job as a congruent tissue. And then also molecules, right? Molecules within the cells are really where a lot of the regulation comes from. And so as you build these larger and larger um, organ systems, uh, you have to rely on the fact that those smaller components are going to be interacting properly. Now, if we think about cells, 
the way that cells communicate, they don't have a mouth, they don't have ears, they can't listen to each other talk, um, the way that they communicate is by coordinating various chemical pathways. So one chemical is produced, it bumps into another chemical, that chemical bumps into another one, and um, all along the line, you're going to have some sort of effect taking place within the cell. Um, and one of the ways in which cells will regulate how various chemical pathways function is through a mechanism that's called feedback. We're going to talk about feedback um, as a regulatory motif uh, in multiple stages throughout the semester. And so really it's common to uh, life really at all levels, not just at the small molecular level, but you'd have feedback um, that can be shown at the ecosystem level as well. We're just going to use it here as an example at the molecular level. So for example, in feedback regulation, feedback regulation is where the output of a process or the product of a process goes back and it regulates the beginning of that same process that created it. There are two different kinds of feedback regulation. You can have what is called negative feedback regulation. Negative has a bad connotation. And so you could assume that in negative feedback regulation, this is where the response or the product goes back and it stops the process that made it. On the other hand, if you think about what positive feedback regulation is for a second. Well, if it's positive, it has a good connotation, then it probably enhances uh, the process that created, and that's in fact exactly what happens. So in this particular slide on the right-hand side, uh, you see an example showing you feedback regulation, but more specifically negative feedback regulation. Uh, in this example, we're using insulin and high blood glucose levels. So up at the top, here we have our stimulus, right? So our stimulus is this high blood glucose level. Let's say you've eaten um, a nice breakfast, uh, maybe it had a donut in it, that's a lot of sugar, and it raised your blood glucose levels. Now, your body, in order to maintain homeostasis or this normal uh, range um, of blood glucose levels in your blood, um, will initiate certain response mechanisms that will help to lower that blood glucose level so that you don't suffer the consequences of having high blood sugar. Uh, and so the way that your body does this is that high blood glucose level stimulates your pancreas and certain cells in your pancreas to produce a hormone that's called insulin. The pancreas produces the insulin, it dumps it into your bloodstream, and the insulin courses through your entire body. Now, not every single cell in your body has a chance to respond to the insulin. There are only two types of cells, really, that can respond to, to uh, that insulin signal to take up blood glucose. These are going to be your liver cells and your muscle cells. The liver and the muscle cells will say, hey, insulin is around. We need to take up blood glucose. And so they'll start absorbing that glucose out of the bloodstream. When they do this, they're effectively decreasing the level of blood glucose glucose. And so they're getting rid of this initial stimulus that started the entire pathway. This is an example of negative feedback. The response or the end product of that um, pathway, so glucose uptake by liver and muscle cells, decreases the initial stimulus, which was the high blood glucose level. An example of positive feedback which would be where the end output stimulates the process that created it. Um, one example that is likely in your textbook is clotting. So let's say you get a cut. When you have a cut, the first thing your body needs to do is plug that hole so you don't bleed out. Uh, there are blood cell fragments in your blood that are called platelets, and they're partially responsible for the clotting at that wound. And so what the platelets do is they aggregate, they begin to aggregate at that injury site. And as they aggregate, they actually secrete chemicals that will encourage even more platelets to come. When more platelets come, they produce even more of that chemical and even more platelets will come. And so you can see how that sort of a building effect and it continues to stimulate um, that, that clotting process. Another example of positive feedback would happen during childbirth. So during childbirth, there's a hormone that's produced by the brain that's called oxytocin. And oxytocin causes the uterus to contract. When the uterus contracts, it starts to push the baby's head against the cervix. 
when the baby's head pushes up against the cervix, the cervix sends a signal to the brain that says, oh boy, we need some more oxytocin. And so the brain produces more oxytocin, which signals to the uterus to contract even more. The more the uterus contracts, the more it pushes the baby's head up against the cervix, the more the cervix sends the message to the brain that we need more oxytocin. And again, this is a positive feedback loop because the release of the oxytocin causing that pressure up against the cervix causes even more oxytocin to be produced until, of course, the baby is born.